And we're back on The Forest at Night. As always, I am Sarah Allen motherfucking Reed. And as a lot of you know, as of late, we've been taking a break from just interviewing musicians and sound engineers and other people involved with the more aural side of music. And just stepping away from music entirely and bringing on writers, artists, and other fine folks that are doing work that I find interesting, and I hope that all of you will find interesting. And this evening, we have a very special guest. Please welcome Emily Crows. Hello. Em is the writer of Our Lady Maven, which, full disclosure, I am the illustrator of. We're doing a graphic novel, issue by issue, crowdfunding, and as we go, you can check out the first issue on zoop.gg right now. And today we're going to talk about something that, again, I think my audience will find pretty fucking interesting because this is a metal show. And uh, more importantly, it's a metal show that hates Nazis. And we're going to talk about the techniques used by spies in World War II to hunt down fucking Nazis. Yes. So, so let's start out by talking a little bit about what is Our Lady Maven and... Uh, what is the, more accurately, what is the inspiration behind the character, um, the primary protagonist, Anna Leavenworth, from Our Lady Maven? Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is, uh, this is cool. I've never been on a metal podcast before. It's so. actually a radio show. Yeah, I'm excited because I don't get this opportunity ever. Yeah. Um, I, I am a latent metalhead myself. Um, I listen mostly to German metal. I don't know how the rest of the metal community <laughs> feels about German metal. Um, but that is that is where I spend most of my listening time. What are uh, what are we talking as far as bands go? Uh, well I you know I start with the the, the typical Ram, I was on the Ramstein uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, pipeline and German metal. So I listen, I've listened to a lot of Ramstein. Um, I found another one. I don't remember who it is right offhand. It sounds very much like Ramstein, though. It's interesting you mentioned Ramstein because that is when I was, uh, you know, when I was younger. Like I used to repeatedly listen to Say and Sut while drawing. That was my drawing music. Really? Yeah. It's like the only album I've ever like repeatedly listened to by them. But I would just sit there and just make comics to that. So it's, you know. It's interesting that we're all these years later. I'm uh, making comics with another Rammstein fan. So, oh, Eisbrecher. Eisbrecher. Okay. Eisbrecher. I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. I do not. I can barely speak English right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, if if you like if you like Rammstein, you'll probably like Eisbrecher. It's good. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah, really good stuff. Um, so you asked me about uh, the inspiration, the inspiration for the the main character. Yep. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about the um, setting. It's World War II. Um, I don't know if you said that. World War II uh, spy story. Yee. So the main character's name is Anna Leavenworth. She's a, she's a spy. She works for uh, an organization called the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. They were a the United States version of uh, a, another organization, the British version called the SOE, the Special Operations Executive. And um, so I base the idea of Anna Leavenworth on the, the real life character of Virginia Hall, who was worked for both SOE and OSS later uh, in the war. So her her stories are incredible, and they they're just now starting to be told more publicly than they have been in past years. But that's where I that's where I pulled the inspiration for the main character, among others as well. But she was she was kind of the main one who was operating in France at the time. You had mentioned when we because uh, we did a bit of show prep before this to kind of figure out and map out what we we're going to talk about because there is a lot of ground we can cover. Um, there is. The, the topics that you're writing about and that, again, full disclosure, I am illustrating uh, for this series, they're pretty fucking in-depth. Um, I've been assembling for like the past five or six months or so just an entire morgue of just reference images for just like three or four different pieces of equipment. Um, so there's there was a lot of ground we can cover. 
But I know you wanted to mention you mentioned that you wanted to talk about specifically how spy work, spy networks operated at the time. So can you give me a bit of a bit of a background in uh, what kinds of environments Virginia Hall would be doing, what kind of things she would be operating in, and more interestingly and more specifically, how she got her nickname? Because I know that's a fun story that you like to tell. Yeah. So it helps to it helps to understand the background of kind of what was going on in France at the time. Obviously, in World War II, France was occupied by the Nazis. And so we w- we would consider that to be a highly restrictive, quote unquote, environment to operate within. So you've got uh, you know, technologically savvy opposition who's looking for you who who has the capability of finding you if they start tracking your trail so virginia hall had two different deployments in france she actually started in france uh, she was there during the invasion and the occupation when the occupation first started she was working for the um the french ambulance corps and so she was. She kind of ended up getting stuck in France. Um, not stuck per se. She decided to stay, but uh, she she started her work as a spy uh, under the cover of a journalist. So she was working. She was working as a an intelligence collector. And when people would ask her, she would say that she was working for the newspaper, which is a, a pretty popular cover story. Um, journalists are you know in, in in effect they are intelligence collections people so her story made sense uh people would give her information she had access to a lot of people with very important information and so she would she would use uh she would use the the ide- the the ideology of um the french occupation like the the dignity of french people and the indignance that they had of being occupied by their neighbor as a, as a way of getting people involved and sharing information. So uh, she was what we would consider a human intelligence collector, human. So she was talking to people and getting this information and then reporting it back to Allied Command. Um, so so she she was very much in the thick of the, the occupation. And at, at numerous times, she was actually, you know, actively being sought by the Gestapo in France. Which is a pretty fucking high honor if you're actively getting tracked down by the highest class of paid goons. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was a I I would consider it an honor for sure. She she had uh she she had a few people who were very much hot on her trail and knew um you know basically everything about her the first time that she was deployed to France. Um the fun thing about her, I mean, there's many fun things about Virginia Hall, but one of my favorite things is that when she, she, she ended up having to flee France. And so she, she did this by going over the Pyrenees Mountains in winter. And so she did this on foot. She hired a, a human smuggler uh, to get her over the Pyrenees Mountains in the middle of winter. And when she, then she got arrested in Spain. And after she was released from Spain, she went back to... Uh, the UK and she got uh, awards and she said don't give me any of these awards I'm going back to France and they said well you can't go back to France they know exactly who you are they have your name they've got you know police sketches of you they there's no way you can go back they're gonna find you as soon as you get back so she said well okay well then if you're not gonna send me then I'll go work for the Americans and do this Right. So that's what she did. Um, she then she went to the Americans, uh, and uh, and they we sent her back. She went in uh, in disguise for her second uh, tour in France, which is where the story picks up her story. Um, Our Lady Maven picks her story up, and um, so so she was she was undercover uh, in an alias. Uh, the second time that she was in France, which I think is really a really interesting aspect. She was uh, she was exploring this sort of undiscovered area of um, uh, of, of disguise operations at a time where this wasn't really a formalized thing that uh, intelligence operators did. 
And she's doing all of this with her, with one leg, functionally. Yes. As the limping yes. lady. That's right. That that was her nickname, the limping lady. So so she had a, she had taken a, I should take a step back. Uh, Virginia Hall was she was always a woman who was trying to push the envelope for women, for for herself, but for women in general. And so when she when she was trying to start her career, she wanted to be a, a diplomat. And so she went to the, the Department of State and they said, we don't hire women. It's not really this doesn't really work for women. Um, and so it, it took her a lot of pushing in order to finally get to the point where she was hired to do work for the Department of State. I sent her to Turkey and uh, on a hunting accident, she shot herself in the leg. Her, she tripped over her clothes uh, in a really unfortunate way, uh, obviously because she injured herself. Um, but she was in the mountains of Turkey and ended up um, getting gangrene in her leg. She got this terrible infection. She had to get flown back to, or not flown maybe, um, she, she was rushed to a hospital and they amputated her leg. So she she did all of the things that I just mentioned. She did this with one leg, uh, a, a, a false leg that she nicknamed Cuthbert. Um, Why? Cuthbert? This is a wooden prosthetic, so it was very painful. What's the origin of the name Cuthbert? Is that just a funny funny name, or? Yeah, that she just came up with this name for uh, for her prosthesis and so so when she would when it was whenever she was in pain she would say you know Cuth Cuthbert's giving me trouble or um and Cuthbert's are being a real pain <laughs> so yeah so she was she she had a sense of humor uh, about her situation uh, as another great thing that I love about her character um and and I mean she's perfect to inspire a, a comic book character I'm I'm shocked that she hasn't been adapted honestly into into a, a comic at that scale before well that's what we're here for so you, so I, I imagine part of the reason why it's never been portrayed, and part of the reason it definitely hasn't been portrayed accurately until now, is because there is a class of individual that played a pretty important role in spy networks and um, just general resistance against the Nazis at this point in history. So let's talk about sex workers and their yeah. role in kicking the Nazis in the teeth. Yeah, so that's another thing that Virginia Hall did that, to my knowledge, no other intelligence collector did at the time. She would go and she would work with, uh, with, brothel with brothels, and she would talk to the women who worked in the brothels, and these, these women were forced by circumstance to sleep with, uh, with Nazis. Uh, a lot of their husbands and boyfriends um, significant others were killed during the Blitzkrieg. And so a lot of them were just left destitute. They didn't have any way to make money. And so sex work was really the only option that a lot of them had. Not to say that there is anything wrong with any of them who ended up there by choice outside of their circumstance, but they they did end up coming into close contact with uh, with the occupying Nazis. And Virginia worked with them to collect information. She would give them requirements. They would collect the information. They would give it back to uh, to Virginia Hall, and she would report it back, just like she did when she was a reporter, uh, undercover reporter. Um, and so, so they they played a very important role, not just in intelligence collection, but also in uh, disinformation operations there against the Nazis as well. There's a very famous story about how after a prison break that Virginia helped orchestrate, uh, the Nazis were looking for these escaped allied prisoners. And Virginia was was feeding information to the sex workers in the brothel that she worked with to, to then give to the Nazis about, you know, there was a rumor that they, you know, got out of France, you know, this way, when in fact they were actually still in France waiting on a Lancaster bomber that would then come and pick them up later on. So um, so there, there were a lot of people who were considered uh, minorities, who were definitely minorities, um, cast asides, 
who were all working together against the Nazi occupation. And the really tragic thing about all of those people who worked in the brothels is that they were all treated like collaborators after the war. And there was never really a an understanding or a, a point of justice for them specifically and the role that they played, because this wasn't, obviously it wasn't admitted for many years that they were involved in this intelligence operation. Right. But even after it became public knowledge, I mean, they were still, um, they, they were never recognized for the work that they did. Which is a goddamn shame. There's even a day, there's such a fucking stigma against sex work, which it, it baffles my fucking mind that, you know. But we, we do, because I, I have the, uh, a little bit more advanced knowledge than most of our readers might and most of the listeners might because, again, I have the script because I'm the one who told you. <laughs> Me! Um, but we, you know, in, in working with Our Lady Maven, we've made a point to try to, you know, give a little bit more dignity to those people. Yes. Yeah, we, we try to maybe include them in the story uh, at some point so that we can at least try to do them justice in, in uh, a work of fiction that's inspired by the work that they did. And what's interesting, um, what might be more interesting at least to a lot of our, our listeners, because I imagine that considering this uh, radio show is hosted by a uh, queer individual, um, I, I wonder who that would be. Um, and again, this comic is made by two queer femmes. Um, trans femmes specifically. So there's a lot of listeners of this show that aren't exactly straight, cisgender, you know. Just generally, we have a lot of fantastic, wonderful listeners that are very queer. And I do want to take a point, or uh, take a second to talk about the queer underpinnings of the series um, that we're working on. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah. So there's just not enough there's not enough works of fiction there's that involve not. queer people. We need more queers in media. There's not. So uh, so we decided why not write one? Um there's there's special challenges with doing that, but um, there's I, I have noticed some very good representation that's been happening in the kind of the broader art world, one probably that, that would make sense to talk about, I guess, is, um, uh, I don't know, should we should we spoil the Harley Quinn thing? Go for it. I don't it. know how many people are watching. I, I, I'm going to be real here. I, uh, I don't know how much uh, this is going to you know count as me falling on my own sword here. I have never read a single Batman comic in my life. Oh, you don't have to read it. It's uh, the animated, the new animated series. Okay, there's a new, is nope. Nobody told me there's a new <laughs> animated series. I yeah, it's it's been out for a couple of years, but it's great. Um, Close your ears yeah. for the next two seconds if you don't want to hear Harley Quinn spoilers. So Harley Quinn is in a lesbian relationship with Poison Ivy, in in the series. Um, and and I, one of the things I noticed recently was that the the creators said that as long as they have control over the story they would never break up so which i thought was really really sweet you're, you're totally but that is one of the challenges like you you don't want to you don't want to write uh, a tragedy with your main characters um i i, I it, know that there's a, there's already like, enough sadness and queer life <laughs> why write more i know this is gonna sound like me being a shit you know just a giant shit post here but you're you're fucking telling me they weren't lesbians already well, that's the thing. We, we just admit it now. I was going to say, like, we have... Oh, like, my God, we admit. We have, like, a, a, a fucking, like, eco-terrorist who loves plants and regularly wears flannels outside of her fucking... And, and then we have, like, chaotic lipstick, you know, lipstick... Li You're telling me these two weren't a couple before now. No, I, I stand the, the high femme DC comic representation. I was going to say, like, the, that's just... No, poison ivy i'm just saying i as a queer kid who has way too many plants around the house i'm, I'm just saying i we, we recognize our own here consider this an endorsement you should definitely watch it okay i i will 
I will put it on in the background while I'm drawing our comics. Um, but you'll appreciate it. So let's talk about let's talk about the tech. Let's talk about the spy tech and the other methods and fun things that we illustrate in the series. I know that one thing that we uh, that we've really been focusing on. Um, because we have a series of uh, um, cigarette cards with things from the series, little pieces of information about spy tech and things that we that were in real life that we're illustrating in the series and that we wanted to give a little bit more background on. One of them is the radio that takes place and is uh, oh, yes. prominently featured on the first couple pages of the comic. So let's start there. Tell me about this radio. Yeah, well, th this is kind of interesting to me in a, in a very nerdy way. The, the wireless radio plays an incredible role in the Second World War, but particularly an important role among spies at the time. So if you were going to, if you were going to be uh, an overseas operations specialist like Virginia Hall or, or, uh, or, or any, frank, frankly, any of the people who were doing intelligence operations, including any of the Jedburg people who had jumped out of planes, just before the D-Day invasion, um, we, we were establishing intelligence networks throughout France at the time. You needed to have some sort of way of communicating back to the command center, and they would do that with wireless radios. At the time, these things were very bulky. They weighed like between 30 and 50 pounds. So you had to carry them in a suitcase. And so this is, this is another big challenge of... of carrying this very heavy thing that is an obvious marker if somebody stops you, uh, if Gestapo pulls you over or stops you in the street and asks to look at your belongings, you carrying a full suitcase sized radio is probably a pretty good indication that you are doing something that they don't want you to be doing. Pretty so, big, so that's a pretty big indication too, like size wise. You would be able to, yeah, you're going to, you're going to see somebody struggling in the street to carry one of these things by hand if you're going from place to place. So there's the challenge of how you get this physically large form factor radio from place to place. And then you also have the problem of how to power it. So they, they didn't necessarily always work by just plugging them into the wall. Um, if you had the right kind of power, you could do that. But in in some circumstances, you didn't have any access to like a wall outlet. So Virginia, for instance, would take her uh, her radio and she would go into the barn, and there was a whole contraption set up with a, a, a bike pedals that were used by hand to to crank and power the radio. So so these radios are really really important. It's actually another really interesting story, because. Virginia was famous for doing jailbreaks. So if there, whenever there were allied people captured in France, she would at least make an attempt to, uh, to, to conceive a plan to, of how to break them out. And in one of these, one of these raids that she planned, she actually, um, she actually got a radio inside the, the prison. Um, and and it's, the it's a very- keep it in the prison? It's a, did I not, never tell you the story? No, you didn't. So, so how, I'm going to let you guess. How do you think they got this radio into the prison? There's, there's no good answer that I could give. There is no good answer. No and the, an, the answer, the answer I'm going to tell you is you'll never guess it. It's, it's a, it's horrible and true. So they had, they had a, they had a, a priest who, it, in France, they wear these long uh, black robes that go down to their feet. And they trained a priest who would often go in and out of the prison to carry this suitcase-sized radio uh, into the prison, clutched between his thighs. Am I'm not gonna lie here. That is not where I thought we were going with this, and that's actually a little bit more pleasant than where I thought we were going with this. <laughs> Whenever a priest is involved, it's a little iffy. Eh, it's, it's insane. But that's how they did it. We play black. So they, we play black metal on this show. I, I'm sure our audience is not gonna mind. <laughs> <laughs> the re the the reality of 
truth. Mm. So they got this radio in, and the the intended recipient took this radio, and they were setting it up. And as, as I should say, it's a low security prison camp that they were in, and they were transmitting messages out of the camp to Virginia Hall, who was consuming the messages and using them to. Uh, make better plans and they eventually did they got those folks out of uh, out of the prison hell yeah like it was a group of about 12 of them yeah alrighty so we have I think it's about all we wanted to cover um is there any any other fun anecdotes cause you're you're obviously coming back on the show later on we will continue having dispatches from sure you know, a hundred years ago at this point. Because again, we fucking hate Nazis in this show. So I have zero objections to repeatedly telling stories about how Nazis got their shit wrecked. So, but but in, in the meantime, is there any other fun anecdotes about knocking some Nazis upside of their head that you'd like to share involving Virginia Hall? Did she ever bludgeon a, you know, bludgeon an SS officer with Cuthbert? Cuthbert? Just take the leg off and smack him over the head? Not that I know of. That would have been bad. Not that I know of. Um, I, I can say that... Um, uh, let me look up his name real quick. And you can cut this out because I just need to do a search for his name. Um, I, we've, we regularly do this on this show. So I'm... I, I, usually I'm the one looking things up on the spot. So... Let me take a moment to actually point out that if, you, if you're interested in the series, you can check it out, zoop.gg. Um, it's at Twitter, Our Lady Maven, or on Twitter, at Our Lady Maven. You know, it's, it's one of those orders of words. And uh, hex is, or uh, M is at hexadecimate, H-E-X-A-D-C-D-E-C-I-M-8. So if you'd like to follow the project and... Maybe give us a couple bucks. There's your link. So. Yeah, please do. I mean, I'll be able to find this guy's name. Um, so I'll tell the story anyway. So she had a she had a, a spy network, Virginia Hall. It's operating a spy net, multiple spy net, networks in in France during her first tour in France, and she took on a source who ended up being a double agent. He was posing as clergy she thought that she could trust him and he ended up being not trustworthy so not only did he sell out all of virginia's contacts that he had access to uh he was the reason that she ended up having to flee france the first time so so this guy Horrible Nazi. I think he was working for the Obvier, so I don't know that he was really a Gestapo source, but he was Nazi intelligence one way or the other. So, you know, he he burns Virginia's entire spy network to the ground. He ends up, uh, you know, after that, he he lives a pretty a pretty fine life. I think he got away initially, and then eventually he got captured after after the Allies uh, started in on D Day. Um, they they eventually found him and he was uh, set to be executed in France after the war. And we don't really have great evidence of exactly where Virginia was at the time of the execution, but we do know that she left the United States for a period of time. Um, and as somebody who was well-versed in how to get in and out of countries in ways that she was not legally allowed to, it's very likely that she ended up going specifically to attend his execution and she may have done so in disguise. We don't really have great evidence of this, but it would have made a lot of sense for her to be in France at the time. Uh, and, and she certainly would have been there for that particular execution. So be like Virginia. Yes. Ever vengeful. As God herself intended. All right, M. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. 
Um, again, if you would like to check out the series about uh, queer, uh, written by two queer women, about queer women punching Nazis in the face, it is zoop.gg forward slash c forward slash our lady maven. I don't know why they uh, add the uh, sub sub page there. It actually makes it really hard to pronounce. More, more importantly, right. get in while we are still doing this early. Yeah. Everybody wants to be an early adopter of something cool. Uh, we, we're going to have many more issues after this. So if you want if you want any of the swag that we have going on, it's probably good to get in now. We are very cool. I'm just saying. So. That's true. My mom says that about me. I... If I had a mom, I'm sure she would say that about me. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can buy original art, um, support the comic, help keep the lights on in the studio. For the, like normally, I don't go out of my way to promote projects I'm directly involved with like this, but this does help keep the radio show lights on. So, all right, Emily, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks again. We uh, normally when we have musicians on, we close the show with a track of theirs I don't think we have clearance to play Rob Stein so we're just going to close the show but if you will play a say and such just sometime tomorrow when you folks wake up because I know it's probably 2am if you're listening to this live go listen to Rob Stein and we'll see you next time on the forest at night <laughs>